Moving forward with our study of sequences and convergence or divergence of sequences, we want to look at the notion of a subsequence. But before we do that, let's recall what it means for a sequence to converge to a certain limit. So we say that the sequence bn has a limit of b, and we write it as the limit as n goes to infinity of b sub n equals b, if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is an n, which is a natural number, such that if little n is bigger than or equal to big N, then bn minus b is less than epsilon. So how we wanna think about this is this epsilon is very, 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 very small, but by choosing this capital N as big as we need to, the values of the sequence are within epsilon of its limiting value. So we have some videos previously where we calculate these kind of limits and go over this a little bit more carefully, so I urge you to look at those if you need to. Now, we wanna look at the notion of a subsequence. So given two sequences, so one of them is A sub N, and that's a sequence of real numbers because we're doing real analysis. And the other one is a sequence N sub K, and those are natural numbers. The sequence A sub N sub K is called a subsequence of A sub N. So let's go ahead and look at an example. So let's say our sequence A sub N is the harmonic sequence, so it's one over N. And then let's say that our sequence N sub K is two to the K. So here we can kind of easily put this together and see that A sub N sub K is equal to one over two to the K. But we could also maybe visualize this a little bit better by making a list. So here if we make a list A sub N, notice here we have that's one over one, which is one, and then one half, and then one third, and then one quarter, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, one eighth, one ninth, and so on and so forth. So this is the sequence A sub N. Now what I wanna do is underline, or maybe I'll square the elements which are part of the subsequence. So in other words, the elements of A sub N sub K. So notice maybe this one is not because the smallest K can be is one. Let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So K is bigger than or equal to one. That's what we're taking as convention here. Although you could definitely have K bigger than or equal to zero. You can even allow K to be negative integers if you want to. So that disallows this one. So that gives us this one right here. So that would be like A sub N sub one. Maybe let's write that down, A sub N sub one. And then this one right here. So here we have A sub N sub two. And then way out here, we have one over eight, that's A sub N sub three. And then so on and so forth. So notice we're gonna skip a bunch and then one over 16, that's gonna be A sub N sub four. So now it's logically called a subsequence because viewed as a set, the set A sub N sub K as K runs from one to infinity is a subset of the set A sub N as N runs from one to infinity. Really, sometimes you wanna think about these sequences just as sets of real numbers and here this subsequence is a subset of the sequence itself. Okay, so maybe I'm going to erase this and we're going to look at a couple of results regarding subsequences. Now that we've looked at a simple example, we're going to look at a basic result involving subsequences. But before we do that, I'm going to refine this definition a little bit. So the definition as we had before will work and that's a suitable definition, but in order to put it in line with something that has some nice results, I wanna add something to the definition. And the addition that I wanna make is that this sequence N sub K is an increasing sequence. So in other words, we have N sub one is less than N sub two, which is less than N sub three and so on and so forth. So like I said, we could have a suitable definition of a subsequence without this inequality, but we wouldn't get many nice results out of that. But if we include this inequality requirement to the definition of a subsequence, or maybe we look at a special class of subsequences that have this, then we get a lot of nice results. Okay, so let's get into our first result. 
So the first little result that we're gonna prove is that every subsequence of a convergent sequence also converges, and I should say that it converges to the same limit. So let's get our setup first. So let's suppose that we have a sequence a sub n, and we'll write n going from one to infinity, such that it converges. So I'll just write that in its e equation form. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n equals l. But that's not enough because we want to take a subsequence from that sequence. So we'll do that by introducing a new increasing sequence of natural numbers. So I'll do that by saying, and we have this sequence of natural numbers, n sub k. So k is going from 1 to infinity. I want to point out that those are all natural numbers such that n sub 1 is less than n sub 2 and so on and so forth. So I guess I could say this um, in the following way with words. We could say that this is strictly increasing. So here we have the sequence of natural numbers, which is strictly increasing. Now, I'll let you guys think about this, but if we have a sequence of natural numbers that is strictly increasing, then it cannot be bounded. So that should be pretty easy to prove. Maybe sketch a proof in uh, the comments if you want to. Okay, now let's see what we need to do to prove that our subsequence converges. So maybe let's go ahead and write down what we want. So we want to show that the limit as k approaches infinity of a sub n sub k also equals L. So that shows that a sub n sub k is a convergent sequence that has the same limit as a sub n. And we're gonna do that by using the proper definition for a convergence of a sequence. So in other words, the epsilon n definition. So let's go ahead and say that we're given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. Now we know since a sub n converges, we can find a capital N where every value of a sub n is with an epsilon of that limit after that capital N. So let's go ahead and do that. So because a sub n converges, and I should say here 2L, we can find a capital N, which is a natural number, such that if n is bigger than um, capital N, then a sub n minus L is less than epsilon. Okay, great. Now we wanna use the fact that our sequence n sub k is increasing, and like I said before, it's an increasing sequence of natural numbers so that it must be unbounded then the fact that it's unbounded means at some point it is always bigger than this capital N. And I should say sometimes here we've got a strict or a loose inequality here. You can really take the definition either way. So let's go ahead and uh, write that down. So notice that since N sub K is strictly increasing, there is maybe say we'll say a capital K, which is a natural number, such that if little k is bigger than or equal to capital K, n sub k is bigger than or equal to capital N. Okay, so that's because this n sub k is strictly increasing. Strictly increasing sequence of natural numbers means unbounded, which makes, means we can make it as big as we want. So what we'll do is we will make it bigger than this capital N, which we retrieved from the fact that a sub n is increasing. Okay, great. But now let's go ahead and notice that if k is bigger than or equal to this capital K, then n sub k is bigger than or equal to capital N, which tells us that the absolute value of A sub N sub K minus L is less than epsilon, kind of from our construction above. So now let's see what that leads us to. So that tells us that the limit as K approaches infinity of A sub N sub K is equal to L, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and clean up this board, and then we'll do another nice little result involving 
subsequences. So for our next result, we're gonna prove that every bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. So this is maybe like the next classic result that you would prove involving subsequences. Okay, so let's see what we need to do here. So we first need to assume that we have a bounded sequence and then construct some subsequence of that bounded sequence that has a limit. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's suppose that we've got this sequence a sub n where n runs from zero to infinity. That's a subsequence, sorry, that's a subset of real numbers such that it is bounded but let's recall what that means. That means that the absolute value of a sub n is less than m for all n, which are natural numbers. And m is some like finite real number. So we wanna think about that as being some fairly large big no uh, real number. Okay, so now what we wanna do is rewrite this inequality relationship with an absolute value as um, being an element of some interval on the real line. So notice that that's exactly the same as a sub n is an element of the closed interval minus m to m. That's gonna be true for all n. But now we can split this up into two pieces. Notice that is exactly the same thing as the union of the two closed intervals minus m to zero and zero to m. And like I said before, this is for all n, which are natural numbers. Okay, so we've got a sub n is n minus m to zero, zero to m for all natural numbers n. But notice there are infinitely many a sub n's. So since there are infinitely many a sub n's, infinitely many of them must land either here or here. So let's talk our way through that. So let's suppose that is not true. Let's suppose only finitely many a sub n's land here and here. That means when we put those two together, only finitely many a sub n's are in minus m to m. But we know there are infinitely many a sub n's because this is a sequence of infinitely many um, real numbers. Okay, great. So now let's see what we can say for that. So um, let's go ahead and reiterate that. So um, there are infinitely many a sub n's in minus m to zero or zero to m. Okay, so just to reiterate where we are, we have argued that infinitely many of the elements from this sequence are either in this interval, minus m to zero, or the interval zero to m. Now, whichever one of those contains infinitely many of them, and both of them might, so in that case, we just kind of pick one at random, we'll call that a sub, sorry, i sub one. So maybe I'll write that here, call it i sub one. And now maybe over here, we'll do a little bit of an example. So let's say that i sub one equals the interval zero to m. So it could be the interval minus m to zero, but it could be the interval zero to m. Okay, so what we have here is i sub one has infinitely many a sub n's. So now what we'll do is pick one of the a sub n's in i1 and we'll call it a sub n1. So let's write that down. So pick an element n. So it's gotta be in the sequence. So I'll write that as uh, the sequence of numbers a sub n, n goes from one to infinity, intersect i1 and call it a sub n1. Okay, good. Now what we wanna do is split i sub one into two equal pieces, just like we did before. So split i one into two equal parts, maybe like in the middle, just as before, and then repeat the process. So what I mean by repeat the process we know that one of those parts has infinitely many elements from a sub n. So we'll pick that part, call it i2, and then pick an element from that part and call it a sub n2. So let's maybe go ahead and write that down. So call the half with infinitely 
many terms, I2, pick one from here and call it A2. A sub N2. So in other words, A sub N2 is in I2. So let's maybe go ahead and sketch out what's going on here. So we have I1 is equal to 0M, that's our example. Now what we're gonna do is take I1 and rewrite it as 0 to M over 2 union M over 2 to M. Now the next thing that we're gonna do is pick whichever half has infinitely many terms from the sequence. Let's say in this case it's m over 2 to m. We'll go ahead and rename that i2. So we have i2 is m over 2 to m. Good. And then we'll take an a sub n2 from there. So we know that contains infinitely many terms from the sequence, so we'll take one, call it a sub n2. So I'll maybe go ahead and sketch that out by saying that we're taking an a sub n2 from in there, and here we're taking an a sub n1 from in here. Now we'll repeat the process again and again and again. So we'll split I2 into two equal pieces. So that's going to be M over 2 to 3M over 4 union 3M over 4 up to M. We know that infinitely many terms are in I2, which means infinitely many terms are in one of those halves. Let's say in this case, infinitely many terms are in this half right here, m over two to three m over four. So we'll go ahead and rename that I three. So m over two to three m over four. And we'll take an element from there and we'll call it A sub n three. And then we wanna repeat this process over and over and over until we've constructed a subsequence of our original sequence A n. All right, I'll clean up the board and we'll move it to the next step. So let's see where we are. We took the fact that our sequence was bounded by this real number m to say that every element from the sequence comes from the interval minus m to zero or the interval zero to m. Now, since there are infinitely many members of this sequence, we know that infinitely many members of the sequence come from this subinterval or this subinterval. Now, we pick whichever one has infinitely many. If both have infinitely many, then we just pick one at random, and we call that new subinterval I sub 1. So if infinitely many of the A sub n are in here, we'll call this one I sub 1. If infinitely many of them are in here, we'll call this one I sub 1. Great. And then we pick an element from, the, from that subinterval and call it A sub n1. And now we repeat that process over and over and over, halving the length of the interval each time. So here we have A sub n2, that comes from I sub 2. And I sub 2 is one half of I sub 1 and it's whichever half contains infinitely many members of the sequence. So now we wanna notice a couple of things. First of all, we have a nested sequence of closed intervals, and we have a result regarding nested sequences of closed intervals that their intersection is non-empty. So I'll just go ahead and write that down. That's a couple of videos before if you wanna check that out. So here we have the intersection as k goes from one to infinity of i sub k is not the empty set. So like I said, we proved that before. And then the next thing that we wanna do is notice that we know exactly what the length of each of these is. So notice that the length of I sub one is equal to M because I sub one is either that interval or that interval. And then the length of I sub two is equal to M over two because that's either half of this interval or half of this interval. And then we can continue that on and on and on, and we come up with this uh, result, which isn't too hard to guess, which is the length of the interval i sub k is equal to m over 2 to the k minus 1. Great. 
Now what we want to do is use the fact that these intersect to a non-empty set to take an element from this non-empty set. And we can actually take any element from there. So let's take L, which is any element from this intersection K equals one to infinity of I sub K. And what we want to do is claim that this L is the limit of our subsequence. So I'll do that by writing claim the limit as k goes to infinity of a sub n sub k equals l. And this proof is gonna be pretty short. We can actually fit it in the room that we have in the bottom. So let's go ahead and write that down, proof. So first of all, we need to be given some arbitrary epsilon bigger than zero. And then next what we'll do is we'll take some capital K, which is bigger than or equal to zero, so that's a natural number, such that um, 1 over 2 to the k minus 1 is less than epsilon over m. So notice epsilon is a very, very small real number, small but positive. But since 1 over 2 to the something approaches 0 as that something approaches infinity, we know that we can find some natural number such that 1 over 2 to the k minus 1 is less than epsilon over m. We just divided over by the m. But now notice that that tells us that m over 2 to the k minus 1 is less than epsilon. Great. Now the next thing that we want to do is notice that if k is bigger than or equal to capital K, we have a sub n sub little k is an element of i sub little k. But by this nesting, we say that's a subset of i sub capital K. But notice that the length of i sub capital K is less than epsilon. So with length i sub capital K is less than epsilon. So what do we have here? We've got two elements from I sub capital K. We have A sub N sub K is in I sub capital K. And then we have this L, which is in all of the I sub Ks, which means it's in I sub capital K. So that means they are within epsilon of each other. So let's sketch that out. So here, let's notice that A sub N sub K and L are inside of I sub capital K, but I sub capital K has length which is less than epsilon, which tells us that the magnitude of A sub N sub K minus L is less than epsilon. And uh, that's the end of this proof, and that's a good place to stop this video.